We may question the validity of a play with all black characters written by a white playwright. But, according to the Pulitzer Prize judges, a lack of empathy should not preclude a straight writer exploring gay representation. In 2021, the Pulitzer Prize for Drama went to Katori Hall for the gay-centred play The Hot Wink King, now at the National Theatre Dorfman. Hall, best known for writing Tina, the Tina Turner musical, is a black heterosexual woman. Though her brother is gay, her understanding of gay men can only be narrow and based on hearsay. And it shows here with characters that provide little more than modern day stereotypes. The Hot Wings King follows four friends as they prepare for the next day's Hot Wings cooking competition. Being awarded the title of the Hot Wing King is the goal of Cordell, Katie of Kiwan. Having entered five times before but never won, the potential title now represents a sense of purpose as he's been lacking since moving in with his boyfriend Dwayne, Simon Anthony Roden, and losing his wife, his children, and his job in the process. Cordell plays the role of tough muscled gay. His confidence may come across as brash, but it masks his insecurities. <sighs> Boyfriend Dwayne is straight acting gay, with an air of self-importance and success defined as a, a job as a hotel manager. Dwayne is a straight man, living a straight life in all but sexuality. <sighs> the strength of the relationship of these two is not clear, so it is illustrated through exposition, through repetition, and too many ill-placed references to fucking. <sighs> Joining this, let's say, couple, here comes gay number three, Daddy Gay. <sighs> Big Charles, Jason Barnett. Barnett's the barber who's cut their hair for five years. Dialogue implies that weight or height may have led to the moniker Big of Charles, but neither is unusual in Barnett. Barnett? Who rather stumbles through lines as though the onstage beer isn't a prop. If you're a player of gay stereotype bingo, you may already have guessed the fourth gay trope to make up this group. Isam. Elisa O'Delli is a camp, bitchy, superficial gay. <sighs> More of a hindrance than a help in the kitchen. Moving in lunges and speaking in innuendo. Isam is that blissfully self-unaware gay we often see in plays. One moment he's stretching butt cheeks, lusting after a straight man. The next he's bemoaning men only want him for sex. <sighs> There's little to connect these for. Even the hot wings that supposedly bring them together every year don't really. Isam has only been with the group for a year, in which he's been with, and not with, Big Charles. A relationship that has absolutely no chemistry or believability to it. And Dwayne is either fucking, or the landlord of, Cordell. The only thing that brings these faux gays together is the conceit of the playwright. Dwayne says he must return to work, cue it's me or the job, arguments, and returns with his troubled nephew EJ, Carisi Denton. EJ's father TJ, Dwayne Walcott, appears to pour straight oil on the gay bubbly water. Really, no one cares. It's performed like a, a self-aware sitcom, meta in its approach. Scene changes and character entrances are accompanied with musical stings. Plot points are foreshadowed with a, a farce-like lack of subtlety. At uh, one point describing the searing heat of a chili, then hiding it away so it doesn't get mistakenly used. It's almost patronising to think we wouldn't guess what's going to happen. It wouldn't be out of place to hear canned laughter at various points. As if sensing this, the audience 
greeting jokes, not just with laughter, <laughs> but waving their arms. <laughs> as they loudly guffaw. <laughs> React to arguments with audibly exaggerated gasps. <gasps> what is already an overlong script pauses in Act One for an, an impromptu and unnecessary rendition of Luther Vandross's Never Too Much, the full song, with dance moves. Performing so well, I heard at least two of the audience members singing along at the top of their voices. But really, what is the point? Too much, too much, too much, too much. It looks sleek, with its huge kitchen bank straight out of the IKEA catalogue, but the stage is unnecessarily large in small dwarfen space. It literally thrusts out into the audience, knocking out the first five rows of the stalls. It feels far too big and shouty for what should be an intimate one set play. It's difficult to understand the thinking of the Pulitzer Prize judges in 2021, although we were just out of COVID, so maybe the competition wasn't fierce. On face value, the Hot Wing King could be taken as just harmless, if unremarkable, fun. After all, this is summer season, and, and sometimes you just want to grab something up off the barbecue rather than sit down to a fully satiating meal. It fills a culture gap, and then with one loud belch, it's completely out of your system and forgotten about. That's all well and good, but we can't overlook the portrayal of gay men, which rather disturbs me. Now, we've moved on from the time when uh, a play having a gay character would raise eyebrows in theatre goers. But visibility is not the end of the story. In our acceptance of gay representation, perhaps we've come to assume that all representation is positive. The Hot Wing King has just returned to cliché, albeit a warm, cuddly cliché, that simply justifies the belief that many hold as comfort, that there are two types of gay men, the sexualized others, neutered as figures of fun, and the non-sexualized us, acceptable because we don't need to think about their bedroom habits. These are the beliefs of a heterosexual woman, extolled by the judges of a prize. For me, that doesn't seem like progress. That doesn't seem like progress at all.